Well, if you really want to do something important with your day, it's time to wake and bake. Captain Hooter, put it down for him. John Sally out. It's Captain Hooter. Hello. Dzień dobry. Bon dia. Dobre utra. Dobre utra. I tu jest Arsyl Dernan. Good morning. Good morning. We look up acting. Buenos dias. Hello. Everybody online looking good. Morning. Sawadi krab. Good night. Dobro horanku. Bon dia. Como va? Habari a tu buhi. Good morning. Oh, what's happening, everybody? Hooter here. In a beautiful tropical paradise. Just getting ready to twist up a fatty. Maybe take off on one of my kayaks and do a little cruise around. And you know what? It made me think about my favorite tropical paradise. And that is Jamaica. And today, we have something very special. So check this out. Come back here in a little bit, and I'll show you around the rest of the island. Hola, everyone. Captain Hooter here, coming to you high and alive. Something really special today. This is something that I've had an opportunity to do myself. Been there myself. Been there, done that. Got the t-shirt, as they say. I am thrilled to have the founder of Canex Jamaica here, Douglas Gordon. Sir, how are you, sir? I'm well, thank you. It's great to see you. Dude, I can't even begin to tell you how much fun and how much I learned at the last event. Um, the access that we had to some of the most brilliant people that were in the industry was, it was such a phenomenal event. I've been talking, I, I mention it all the time whenever I'm talking to people about having the right kind of format with the right kind of people. You guys killed it on that last one. And then when I got the notice the other day that we've got a brand new one coming up, here you are. Tell me what's happening. What's going to be this room? Thank you, sir. You know, it, it, it's, it's a real joy to hear that. You know, where Canix started was always about the people. It was always about creating energy and really having a genuine desire to see people come together and exchange knowledge. That's really what we've we said from day one. You know, when people ask me about opinions or what we're trying to skew, I always said, we're a platform, you know, people who are totally against cannabis, you're welcome to come. You know, people who are totally for cannabis and want to hear nothing different, you're welcome to come because that's the only way we're going to sort of debunk some of these myths and destigmatize it is if we actually have open and honest conversations. So we all have an opportunity not to learn different facts, but to learn perspectives and understand, you know, how people are coming at it so we can better move this whole industry forward. Um, and, you know, in 2019, we really said, you know, I've been to a number of conferences that I'd seen grow and expand over time. And some of them became really, you know, beautifully polished up. And it was, you know, really corporate, if you will. And yeah. I said to myself, boy, you know, we've benefited by exactly what you said, you know, some of the real industry heavyweights, if you will, uh, and I don't just mean corporate, I mean, in terms of just knowledge and education, advocacy, and sort of sacrifice, coming to us and being real with people, you know, talking to the, the other corporate person, as well as a traditional farmer, and both conversations being just as important, just as valuable. And how do we continue to, to, to maintain that? You know, yes, there's a huge, there's a huge spirit of authenticity. There's a, you know, I think it's one of our, uh, the brand DNAs, if you will, to sort of start in marketing speak, because it's real. But also, what do we do to continue to facilitate and engender that type of energy around our, our event? And I was really just to say, how do we take full advantage of what Jamaica offers us? You know, we built our conference in such a way that our content moved away from being exclusively or very much central to what's happening in Jamaica and much more about a global conversation, a global movement, a global uh, platform, if you will, for where does the industry go from here that takes place in Jamaica? So how do we really weave into the content and the, the networking and the structure so that people could really have that full experience of what makes Jamaica so special. And that's why we added 
the different networking events. You know, we go out to some of the dispensaries. We we have the parties, and you know, all well curated as best we can, if you will, to to facilitate that kind of interaction between people. So I'm really happy to hear that it landed, and I can mm -hmm. promise you we're going to do even more of that in 2020, 2022. Yeah. I had such a blast, and I learned so much new things. And again, I'm a professional interpreter. I'm supposed to know most all this stuff. It's a very, very different environment and a very, very different kind of set of circumstances that everyone is working with there on the island. And at the same time, you on this event, you, you, you create this bubble that is happening right here where all of these business people and all of these entrepreneurs and all of these people who are truly passionate about the flower are all getting together in one spot. Yet, as I've talked about many times, you go outside and you take a break. Uh, I did it with Jonathan Hirsch multiple times when I was there last time. And we would go outside and there would be some Rasta growers over in the corner who couldn't get in, but they were standing there. And the first day they had a couple of big spirits, come see, come see, right? After we went over and did some professional interpreting on the buds, the next day there were 30 people out there trying to bring their buds in. People were starving for the, 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 um, the education aspect. Right. And that's exactly what you, it was, you're going to rock this, man. No, I can't wait. I, pre I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. And it's nothing, you know, I feel it's more of a, of a authentic intention that we, that we plant the seed of because it's really not things that we can take credit for per se. It's just that it's bringing people who are well-meaning and have at the heart and soul of what they're doing, a greater respect for the plant and the industry. And so, you know, I'm sure in that, in that setting, because I remember Jonathan even telling me, you know, that at first there's a lot of, I wouldn't call it, the, 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 the advice was open with welcome arms initially. This is what, if I recall what he yeah. said. Yeah. But again, because you're bringing people who, you know, at first glance is like, what does this guy know that I don't know? And then, yeah. well, hold on. He sounds like he might be, you know, so, oh, he does know something. Oh, he's, he's a real dude. And then that's where <laughs> you get other people saying, no, Bredrin, come and hear what they have to say. Like they have a sort of different level. And that yeah. kind of environment that facilitates respect I think is what's so incredibly important. You know, a lot of folks have come into Jamaica with this, you don't know what you're talking about kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here's the truth. Even if I don't know what I'm talking about, you can't treat me like I don't know what I'm talking about because then I won't yeah. listen to what you have to say. You know, but if you instead listen to where I'm coming from, then we have a mutual respect. And now my ears are open to hear what you have to say because I know your ears are open to hear what I have to say. And I think right. that's been the basis of Canex over time. It's just having that body of people that has swollen and swollen and swollen to have similar minded individuals. And it allows for that kind of dynamic exchange. And I, I love that. I love the fact that it's like, it's, like, it's like you just drop a pebble in the pond and you see the ripples. And people tell you about, you know, this ripple out here is so significant. And you're like, well, I can't really take credit for that ripple. I just drop the pebble in the pond with the right okay. intention, you know, and that's what yeah. this industry does. You know, it was one thing when I was there and just going through the, uh, uh, going through the event, uh, as you know, I came back and I ended up spending almost a year there living there during the COVID. Uh, I, I was able to uh, hide out in Jamaica, which was amazing. And while I was there, I had a chance to go to every herb house that was in Jamaica and got a chance to meet a ton of different growers and, Everyone, every single one that I met was receptive to working together and helping each other. It's, it's, it's a very unique kind of a scenario too, because like I've had several top growers. Well, Jonathan was a good example. He's, he's an outstanding grower. And, uh, you know, we would sit there and talk with some of these, some of the, uh, the bush ganja growers, you know, and they would show us their buds and uh, I would pull out a black light, right? Nobody uses black lights. And I could, I was showing him black lights. This is how you can see mold and mildew on the, and we taught, I mean, Jonathan and I went back and forth. I would evaluate and look at the buds and then Jonathan would tell him how to fix it mm. and, you know, do that. And again, our numbers grew every single day. But when I was back there and doing, uh, writing the book, the artists that are there, 
there is here's the little insight there's a ton of really high 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 quality cannabis that's being grown there that tourists never see mm. <laughs> you'll mm. never see this it's it's gone somewhere else there are true wizards that are there uh magicians in what they what they've put together it i'm so excited for jamaica if the politics get straightened out since i left what's happened with the politics how is it looking there as far as well, you know, what happened in, it's not a function of the pandemic, it's really preceded that, you know, you started to see a lot of some of these publicly traded Canadian companies in particular that had invested here with much fanfare, you know, uh, we started to sort of pull out and the, the, the guys was, you know, the export regulations weren't in place, yada, yada, yada. But the truth is, you know, Jamaica got into an unfortunate relationship with some of these entities not recognizing what their end goal was you know their end goal was to say i planted a flag in jamaica and now i'm out you know it was never yeah. really i planted a flag in jamaica and i want to develop a footprint here i want to be somebody meaningful or significant in the industry at the same time there were some who i believe planted their flag but because they plant their flags all over the place and the industry shifted you know they had to consolidate they had to sort of rein in some of their cost stuff so you know corporate it shifted but more than anything else, I think, you know, you have a, a disconnect or you've had a disconnect in the industry between people who are there to regulate it and facilitate it, um, instead wanting to manage it, you know what I mean, in a way in which yes. they understand it. And so you have some peculiarities that have manifested in these operating entities that I think, you know, the, everybody who has a, a license and is producing in Jamaica they should get some sort of a, a, a hero medal. I mean, maybe that's mm -hmm. true of everybody, yes. all of us in this industry, right? But particularly in Jamaica, because, you know, having navigated the path to get the license, having navigated the path to set up your shop and operating in the Caribbean is no easy feat, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of benefits and pluses that come from being down here, don't get me wrong, but it's not an easy feat. But the fact that the regulators up until recently, I think, just were so disconnected from the realities of operating the businesses that it made that whole process that much more complicated, you know, and that much more difficult. And what I, what I hope, I feel very enthusiastic about some of the utterings I've heard from the regulatory body, which is the CLA and other people around it is that mm -hmm. there's a real recognition that something has to change and it is changing. There's a real recognition that, you know, there's a meaningful industry here that employs a lot of people here that has not even tapped into a small modicum of its potential. And okay. so we need to have a different approach to it. You know, I've seen, um, you know, I've even heard like from a, a former head of the Economic Growth Council, who's now sort of spearheading um, a number of things in cannabis, you know, they're taking a much more serious uh, perspective on it. And I think that's very welcomed. At the same time that I'm encouraged by it, I'm seeing a number of the private enterprises, you know, coming out of COVID now with like revitalized plans, you know, they're, they're talking about different strains, you know, Epican that's been, you know, a real pioneer in, in the legal space, you know, they, and they've, they've, they've weathered a number of storms, you know, which yeah. again, in this industry, everyone has, right. But, mm -hmm. you know, they've weathered their storms and, you know, they've just come out with a, a line of very limited um, high grade um, strains which you need to come back to and, and sort of really evaluate for yourself. But yeah. it's encouraging, you know, it's really encouraging to see the resilience, but also the, the sort of, you know, recommitted enthusiasm and recognition of what this industry can really bring. Um, mm -hmm. So from that perspective, I'm extremely encouraged. And I think more than anything else is, is really getting out of our own ways of latching onto, I won't call them excuses, but latching onto reasons why we can't proceed because you know this industry has existed has thrived has prospered in spite of all the regulations in place or lack thereof and mm -hmm. so it's really more a function of recognizing the good that we can do through this plant not just by healing people but in the case of the caribbean um supporting communities you know improving gdp reducing dependence on foreign exchange to buy medications. You know, there's a whole knock-on effect that has significant direct impact in, in this region in particular. And mm -hmm. I think it's a wonderful thing that, you know, at Canix, we can bring people together from around the world, some of whom want to do something in Jamaica, some of whom don't. 
You know, they're just mm -hmm. they're just using it as a as a as a meeting point to connect with their colleagues from around the world and see how we advance the industry. But I think now that we're getting to a place of people really appreciating, understanding, and respecting the importance of this industry has a potential to play. There's a different mm -hmm. level of perspective that's being brought to it, and that's very welcomed. I think Jamaica has all the possibilities. I thought this when I was there. Uh, while I was there, I was going, look at all of the potential that this place has. Then I had the misfortune of, through one of the contacts, having one of the government officials come to my house. And uh, he, I'm not going to mention his name. He was, he's one of the, the mucky mucks. And uh, we sat and had the conversation. And I, I was trying to, you know, using my, my imagination and, and telling him all these possibilities that I saw. And what he told me was, and, and I'm going to quote, I'm going to quote this. He says, I want to keep those people in the grill. Mm. That is my intention. I want to keep those people in the Negril area and everything down here is family. And, the, and as I sat there and I, I mean, we, we were talking for 45 minutes. He had zero knowledge about this plant, none. And yet he was very specific about there was already this game plan that was in place in, in his head at least about the future of cannabis in Jamaica, which was gonna be, we're just gonna take this part of the island and turn that into the, 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 the ganja uh, fantasy land. Right. Um, the potential for all of the cool things that could, while I was there, I heard projects coming out all over the place. One of the ones, and I think I talked to you about it, was a guy who wanted to take one of the, the golf courses that uh, it had, was going belly up and he wanted to turn it into a walking magic mushroom park. Wow. Which, which was, and he's got okay. diagrams and the, I, I went, and he says, yeah, you just walk up and you'll be able to, and, and we'll have it uh, protected around the outside so that nobody can wander off. So it'd mm -hmm. be this completely safe environment and you're in paradise uh, walking on the soft grass and we'll have little displays and things uh, around the golf course. So many brilliant people that came to your event, and I'm going to just highlight one, Bruce Linton, mm. um, the man who I didn't expect to really have too much time for people because at that time he was the uber bigwig, right, in the industry. And that man spent more time with everyone, little, big, didn't matter what to, it just a, a, a nothing question he sat and took the time he was so impressive to me and again i had never i knew who he was but i had never seen him work before can i ask do you know if he's going to be coming back for this yeah, year well, bruce, bruce hasn't confirmed as yet but bruce has been with us i think from the first time he came every year thereafter so it's either three or four times and I, again you know I, I relay this back to whatever that whatever that magical thing is is that when people come, it's with a real sense of, it, 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 it's a real gravitas. You know, they, it, they're very humbled about the environment that is Jamaica. And I think people mm -hmm. have this respect for not just the destination, but the people in their environs where it's not a poppy show. You know, you're not coming here to be, as you said, the superstar. You're coming here to be amongst people who care about the plant and the industry. And mm -hmm. I think that in of itself is is what engenders that kind of, you know, approach and behavior um, when they come. Because, you know, I've seen it, like we had President, you know, Vicente Fox when he came, right? President, yeah, former president, that, yeah. same thing. You know, we had people from the, 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 the Growers Association in, in, in St. Anne, I'll never forget, there's a group of like four or five of them. And they were like, could we please talk to, to you know, President Fox? And I'm like, he's right there. You know, like yeah. I can take you over, but you can also go yourself because it's that kind of environment, you know? Yeah. And, 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 that, and, and, and that, that I think is really consistent with what this, this real industry is. You know, when I first got into this, a, a brethren of mine here in Jamaica, he said to me, Dougie, you have to understand the plant has an energy. And I'm coming in this from straight, like, you know, more of a, a very defined linear kind of yes. corporate mindset. I'm like, what are you talking about? Uh, you know, maybe it'll offend people. I'm like, it's an agricultural product. Like, what do you mean it has an energy? And he's like, no. And he explained it to me. 
And he's like, you know, you can grow the same plant and talk to it and care for it and, and show that you have, con you know, consideration for it as you care and water it. And you can do the same thing, treat it poorly, give it water and just be dismissive and you get two totally different outcomes. And I have seen that time and time again, as I've been in this industry, you know, the people who are real and authentic and true, those are the folks that stick around. Those are the folks that see meaningful progress, you know, from yeah. it. And, and I just want to say one thing, because I like to, I like to say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a you know, a, a problem solving kind of person. That's where my mindset is. And so, you know, I've heard that, you know, people think in the Caribbean in particular, people down here, be like, oh yeah, ganja, no problem. Like, why is it even illegal? We tend to be way more conservative mm -hmm. than people in North America and Europe, right? And a part of that is because of the stereotypes over time. You know, if you're a successful business person, then, hey, how do you make your money? You know what I mean? Now that you're here in London doing whatever, where'd you get your money from? So people have sort of been like, no, I'm going to stay very far from that. The other reason is, some of these misguided notions of, of, of cannabis and ganja over time and what it does to you have been able to penetrate our communities much quicker and in a much more forceful way because they're smaller. You know, so it's easier to reject ideas that are a little bit outside of the norm. Whereas in bigger communities, you can find, you know, folks who are a little bit more curious and have an avenue to feed that curiosity by now being exposed to fact, right? So you have sure. bigger populations that question the proverbial status quo than you do in the Caribbean. But the biggest thing that we have failed to do as an industry is we have failed to undertake the sort of economic um, study that will demonstrate to these governments and the populations the significant impact that cannabis can play, you know, can, can, can add to economies. Because, and, and we have to take responsibility for that. We can't sort of say to a person who their whole life has been told, this is bad, 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 bad. There's nothing good that's going to come from this. We can't just sit here and think that they should just wake up and smell the, the coffee, right? Mm -hmm. um, Blue Mountain coffee is pretty good in Jamaica. But, they, you know, this yes, is one day, they're all this stuff and shift their position. It's not going to happen. We have to show them. And as much as we know how cannabis became illegal and how ridiculous that was and how obvious that was, that it had nothing to do with the plant whatsoever, but for other commercial and monopolistic interests, no matter how many times we tell people that, you know, you still realize that the human mind is really quite fascinating and that, you know, you, 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 you hear something long enough and you believe it to be a fact. Even when someone presents to you, the reason you first started hearing that is completely wrong or it's a mm -hmm. fallacy. You're like, oh my gosh, it's terrible. But then you still believe in it because it's been told to you longer than the fallacy has been revealed to you. So yeah. we have to take the proactive steps to, to show them the benefits. And I think that's one of the big challenges in, you know, Jamaica led the way in the Caribbean in terms of legalization. That's one of the biggest issues here in terms of how the regulations came down and in particular how they're enforced is it was done, but I don't think enough of a communication strategy was followed to say why it's being done. So you don't have a, a, a large swath of the population saying this is important, that this is safe, that this is healthy. You don't have that. You don't have folks who are making economic driven decisions saying, oh my gosh, this is going to be so much, so more, much more beneficial for the country. You know, we have sure. the opportunity to change GDP per capita just by implementing this and doing it in a safe and healthy way. Those things have not been done. And I think until those are done, you're going to have folks who are saying, okay, okay, we have to, we have to legalize it. I get that, but let's stick it over there or oh. let's limit it to this or limit it to yeah. that. Um, I remember when the guy said those people, you know, when he said those people, I want those people over there. And I went, oh, my God, that's 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 no bueno. That's not the right answer. You know, one quick thing also, which is which is also one of the interesting contradictions uh, that I found in living there. Um, if I if you were going to ask me just on my year of, of being there, what were what is the number one handicap? You know this better than me, but just from the general kind of overall, I would have said old, old people and Jesus, God. There was a lot, I saw so many religious types of, and obviously not Rastafarian, but I mean, uh, 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 Christians, Catholics, um, that spoke about cannabis as almost like it was coming from the pulpit. 
talking about it, uh, about the harm it might cause. At the same time, I found several of those same people that were talking to me had a big bottle of rum up mm. in the, the kitchen cabinet with a big giant uh, bud in the inside mm. of it, which has been going on for what, 50 years? They've been, uh, everyone uses that as a, as a form of medicine, right? Yep. Um, so a bit, there's a that con contradiction, right? That's it's like. It's a contradiction, but it's also, you know, it's facilitated and perpetuated because of a lack of education. So meaning that, you know, I don't want everybody to be able to have access to alcohol, but I can drink alcohol because I know how to handle it in moderation. But if, if, if everybody's going to just drink it willy nilly, then absolutely that's a problem. So people who have been exposed in direct contact, their grandmother, their great grandmother, their parents to using cannabis in a healthy way, they still have this idea that they are going to do it in moderation. So it's different than if you open it up for the population, and everybody's going down the street sort of zoned out. You know, and that that's a part of, again, from my perspective, and I could be off base here, but I think the industry has a responsibility to shift that narrative, because sure. in, in, in shifting that narrative, you will have a more receptive um, population, which means a more receptive government infrastructure. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean it should be that way, but it is what it is. And, and you got to focus on how do you solve the problem? How do you navigate around the obstacle versus, you know, the obstacle shouldn't be there in the first place. Well, you might be right, but you'll also be stuck, you know? And I think that's one of the things, if I had to level a criticism per se at the industry of which I'm a part of, you know, mm -hmm. we have not done is really embarked on a cohesive, collective, significant communication platform strategy to really educate the population as to why this is important. You know, Educate. and until that's done, you're going to still be facing winds that are in front of you versus to your back. Yeah. Yeah. You're right on the numbers, dude. It, it's education is everything on this whole, you know, yeah, it's really interesting because I, I don't know if you've heard any of the, the kind of the new things while I was here in, in, in Portugal, um, you know, they have a, a similar kind of scenario that Jamaica has in that, you know, they're legal here. Everything's legal here, but not really. And there's not, you know, there's no real hardcore, you know, place where you're going to go and be able to get any recreational anything legally here. Mm, mm. Something that's interesting and something that came up during this weekend where people were talking about the new uh, in, in the States, and I don't even know, I'm, I'm bringing up something you may not even know anything about, but they were talking about the, the new um, isolation of THCO and THCP. I can see all these new products coming yeah. out all over the place. And Jamaica is heaven for this, right? Well, you know, I, oh. I, think, it, I think it's fascinating, the, the technology, the innovation, you know, that's coming from all these different products and the derivatives, you know. But I also feel, particularly in the case of Jamaica, and wider than that, just the therapeutic use is not, you know, we're, we're sort of, sometimes we're too, a little bit too smart for our own good, you know, but the therapeutic use and getting back to something simple um, with nature, you know, that's what, to me, you know, the Rastafarian community and that culture of, of ganja and cannabis has represented for so long globally. You know, it's about, it's about being one with yourself. It's a, about commun communing with nature and being sort of at peace. And, and I also want to see that develop more you know like you're talking about yes. tourism applications and you know wellness is such an incredibly um vast opportunity and here you now have a, a location in jamaica as well as the rest of the caribbean where particularly in what we've all enjoyed over the last two years it's brought to the fore the fact that we need to take better care of ourselves. We need to love ourselves better. We need to be more mindful about and deliberate and intentional about how we live. And I think, you know, cannabis and, and psychedelics in particular as well, you know, things that allow us to be in that state of wellness and holistic health, you know, afford us a, an ability to live more fulfilling individual lives. So I'm not taking anything away from the innovation. I think it's fantastic and it's wonderful and I want to see it continue. But I also believe that in parallel to that, there's this massive narrative that the, the quote unquote average person out there, right, which I put myself in that bucket, 
better understanding of how therapeutically this can serve people and how they can get better. It's a massive, massive, you know, um, opportunity. And it's one that we, we mustn't lose sight of, even as we chase and, and, and evolve and innovate, uh, because right. it is so vast and it is so real. And more importantly, it's so needed. Are you still doing, I know you were involved uh, doing some of the, uh, the mushroom sessions, uh, therapeutic mushrooms. Is that still happening or is that? Uh, no, so that I, I, res I, re I resigned from Silo. All right. right. Okay. I'm so I'm still involved in terms of Marley One and, and, and pushing that forward, both on the functional side. But I, I right. will say this is, you know, my exposure to psychedelics and the impact they have on people. Um, it's so transformative that I, you know, my personal career path is, is never, will never take away shine from yeah. how significant that is. And for me, just the, the, the opportunity to facilitate people coming on those retreats. And, and having those experiences from themselves is a gift that I will never, mm -hmm. ever, um, you know, shy away from, irrespective of everything else. You know, it's something that I encourage people to this day and into the future will to go on that path. Because, yeah. you know, what is our journey? Our journey is really to live and be the best version of ourselves. You know, I can't be you. You know, I can't aspire to be you. I can only aspire to be the best version of Douglas Gordon that I was put on this earth to be. And a lot of our challenge in being that individual is in our own heads, is our own blockages, it's all our own doubts. And psychedelics allow us to go on a, a journey to remove some of the traumas that we've had in our lives. And I'm not even talking about, you know, folks with clinical issues. I'm talking about the regular, you know, every single Fish. one of us, you know, take away that trauma and live that more fulsome experience. And I think cannabis as a daily habit you know as a pathway to just spirituality also affords us that that wonderful opportunity so i think it's important that we take plant medicine um and really bring it back to its grounding you know it, it is natural it is earthy it is so connected and if we lose sight of that i mean yeah i mean, I mean it sounds a little woosah sometimes but i mean it, it's the truth and it's, it's us pursuing that path. And, you know, through what we do at Canix is we want to keep that platform there so people can come and learn, people can come and network so that they can go off in their own, back to their own zones um, mm -hmm. with these connections that they can now, you know, expand from there and heal more people. I mean, I think that's, a, you know, that's really the goal and the important thing that we do in plant medicine. Yeah, well, I can get, I can vouch for the fact that it definitely, uh, you accomplish that goal. Uh, the connections that I made from your event uh, continue to blow my mind. Um, uh, virtually everyone I met there at one point or another, I am still interacting with and awesome. working on projects and stuff with, and we all talk about, uh, about coming back with a, a great endearment uh, from uh, the experience. Can you tell me a little bit more about this year yeah. Uh, and what what do you have planned special for this year's or or do you, that you know that are confirmed already the yeah so, so this year we have um we have well we're going to start off at the, the johnny cash house as we always do that welcome oh, party yeah. it just seems so fitting and so beautiful and yeah. then you know we have two days of conference on the thursday and friday so um you know thursday evenings we have our uh, our party at one of the dispensaries, which we're finalizing now. We've done Kaya last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then on Thursday evening also, we're adding this year a, uh, an infused dinner experience. So Ooh. we have, yeah, we have a couple of um, folks coming in who are gonna facilitate that. Um, and then on Friday evening, we're gonna have our High Vibes uh, sort of cocktail. So High Vibes yep. is you know, the big closing party we typically do, but we're gonna, we're gonna modify that, bring it right into the convention center in the middle. Ooh. So that people, you know, we get a lot of the traditional farmers who come and you know, it's, it's something you overlook very easily, but just the transportation costs and just you know, moving out of zone or if they're out of town. So we really wanted to kind of keep that, that, that vibe together. You know, so we're going to do that Friday evening after our awards ceremony, which will take place in the Expo Hall. And then Saturday, we've added a golf tournament, right? Oh. So we have the Canex golf tournament. And, um, and then Saturday afternoon into the evening, we have our all-white beach party. So we, yeah. we've added all the different elements we think that are important to really showcasing the, that Jamaican Caribbean experience. 
as well as the same time making sure we stay true to what have been our linchpins with 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 this conference that is you know excellent content you know top class speakers from every different discipline um we're going to bring into so we're going to have some cannabis we're going to have some psychedelics included in the discussions mm -hmm. you know more general plant medicine conversation and one of the things that we're doing and this is why the infused dinner and the golf tournament are of particular excitement to me is we're working with the minorities for medical marijuana which we're going to announce pretty soon to create something called the high vibes foundation and okay. the high vibes okay. foundation is going to be all about supporting in the first instance the rastafarian community and then wider into other indigenous communities to be able to participate in the legal cannabis space you know we want to provide a platform where there's education there's incubation and, and ultimately there's also resources um available for them to participate you know it's, yeah. it's such a role in this industry and i think it's important that we recognize it not just with words but find the mechanisms through which we can you know support it with resources yeah you know it's funny because it, when you talk to people when i talk to people all the time and i talk about you know growing weed in jamaica and they go ah oh, that's easy you throw the seeds in the ground and then you know they <laughs> pop out and you know after spending some time with some of the top growers on the island. I have learned what incredible witches these guys are. Warlocks, witches, warlocks. There is, there's levels to this. And this, you're, you're talking about fighting a, a, a sword battle against 50 guys is basically what they're doing. There right. are so many challenges to growing good bud in Jamaica, which is contrary to what most people think. They, yeah. they oh yeah, you know, you're just to grow the good stuff. You have to be a witch and you have to, what I was telling somebody the other day, I said that the best grower that I met, the one guy that I met there that was the best, no girlfriend, no wife, no, no friends, his friend, his wife, his, his girlfriend are his plants. Right. And he is with those plants all the time because mm -hmm. there's so many challenges to growing there. So many things that can come at you to screw up your grow way more than what most people figure yeah. uh, or understand. And it's, um, I, I learned a ton from, again, these, what I call an urban, uh, but high end urban uh, uh, grower. Do you think that you can see a, a path somewhere? in the near future, let's say within a year, do you think ganja could get legalized across the board? And just what would have to happen for that, for that to happen in Jamaica, where they just said, you know what, all good, completely I think, decriminalized. I think uh, an, a real economic impact study would have to be done. So people understand that this is not just something that people that like ganja want to see legal, right? For no other benefit. I think that would have to be done. And at the same time, a real educational campaign. You know, it's funny because you mentioned earlier about some of the, the older folks who are most against it and yet they use it. And, yeah. you know, in, 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 in doing some work before with, with CBD into this market, what I found so fascinating is that when you have the conversations with folks like, oh, you can't legalize, this legalized thing is gonna get all the youths running around, blah, 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 blah. But then when you actually ask them, you know, like where the ailments are, you know, where their pains are, how they're, how they're living. And then you show them that this can help them. And then they actually experience it. And they're like, oh my gosh, you know, I can move. My arthritis is no longer like, <laughs> you know, crazy. it takes that. It takes the, because the funny part about it is some of the, some of those older folks, they're in more desperate search of solutions because they've tried all the stuff that doctor gave them. They've done this, they've done this. There's 17 medications because of the, the aches and pains. And so if you can get rid of that, they're like, well, hold on a minute. I'm now open to trying something new because what I've been doing is not working. But I think one is an environment where there's more receptivity, there's more interest in understanding the industry because there's an economic understanding of how it impacts the country. And I don't mean just at the top. I mean, in terms of the population, understanding that, you know, Jamaica offers free healthcare. And I put that in inverted commas because when you go to the hospital with your child, um, and to avail yourself of that. And it takes you, you know, six hours to be seen. And then you have to schlep across somewhere else to go get the medication. And then they tell you have to come back. You know, the, 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 the impact, the cost from a productivity, from a human spirit perspective is so in, in, immense. 
that when you think in terms of one, there'll be less sick people because it's because of you know wider accessibility. And number two, you now have resources because of the tax revenues that cannabis can can generate and and the economic stimulation, where free healthcare can be administered in a in an efficient manner. So that six or eight hour journey can now be an hour and a half. You know, you have to communicate all of these things to the population at all ends of the spectrum in a way that they can see the benefit. So that's number right. one. And number two is, is, as I said, is really just making people f- understand how this can, especially in a small country, you know, Jamaica's 3 million people. You're talking about 5 million tourists. So you now talking about a, a, a market that's, that can immediately impact and not just the commercial aspect of it, but the foreign currency generation aspect of it. Mm-hmm. You know, those are the things that you have to communicate. And then I believe that will help to drive the, the shifts, drive the changes that will make people say, hurry up and get this done. You know, a lot of times we think that politicians lead change, but poli- politicians manifest what the people want, really. You know what I mean? Right. So it, it's really more a function of giving the people the knowledge and the desire to push for change and that allows the politicians to more readily facilitate it because they know it's what the people want. Um, right. So that's what I think we have to do. Interesting. Yeah. Now, do you think that if let's let's go into a fantasy scenario here and let's say that um, uh, Joe Biden uh, gets to the end of his uh, campaign and in order to save the election, he legalizes everything in the United States. We'll just go into a fantasy here. Right. <laughs> and he legalizes everything. Do you think that that will expedite Jamaica uh, flipping the switch? Or do you think that there's still a long path to get there? A hundred percent. A hundred percent it will expedite for sure. I mean, a big part of a big part of the consideration, you know, all the way down from how finance is run in the Caribbean, how the banks view correspondent banking. I mean, you're talking about a country that has, you know, basically five, five banks, you know, five major banks. And so there isn't any room for risk taking. There isn't any room for saying this is OK. Uruguay did it, et cetera, et cetera. It's just easy to say, look, you know, our business is, is X and we don't need to mess with Y. So we won't. Yeah. And that's obviously, you know, um, constrains the industry growth. But the U.S. taking a major step forward in saying, look, this is going to be federally legal. That's going to open up things for the Caribbean overnight. Um, the double-edged sword for that, of course, is that it will also remove some of the opportunity for people in the Caribbean because now you have so many more entrants coming in with more capital, more resource, more expertise, um, and a longer game plan. You know, some of these entities, as we've seen in other industries, you know, they can stick around and say, look. We're going to take market share for the first three years. We really don't even care how much money we lose because when we consolidate, we'll make it all back in year four, five, and six. So, you know, if you have the capital to play the longer game, that squeezes out the smaller participant, the smaller entrepreneur. And that's where some of the innovation comes from. That's where some of even the human care comes from. You know, entrepreneurs in the Caribbean, yes, they want to be successful business people, but there's also a connection to the people they employ. There's a connection to the community that they're, they're based in. And all of these things have a, you know, a net positive effect. Folks who don't have those same connections, you know, it's, it's very different. So I think it's a double-edged sword for us in the Caribbean to sort of sit on our hands until the U.S. shifts. Right. Because when that shift comes, the tidal wave that comes with it will wash away a lot of the opportunities we get. Um, to be able to, to, to design this and implement this in a way that serves our communities. Have you seen any uh, inclination from any of the other Carib- uh, Caribbean countries that might pull the trigger before Jamaica? Well, St. Vincent anything? has been very, St. Vincent came after, but they've been extremely um, proactive, um, you know, and, 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 and balanced. You know, it's not like they're out there playing the wild, wild west. You know, they've been very committed to doing this in a way that serves their population, right, responsibly, but also is mindful of the traditional participants. You know, how do we get them involved? How do we keep them in a, in a, in a state where they can participate? So that's a, that's a good model. A small country, yes. Um, Trinidad is now talking about doing some stuff. They've just passed legislation down there. 
Um, Antigua is coming on stream. Bahamas is, is looking at it. I just heard it's up, you know, something that's you know, happening in Turks and Caicos. So the Caribbean is coming together. Barbados has also done some stuff. I think what the Caribbean also has as a, as a, as a significant opportunity is to work together, you know, create a regional trading block so that you yes. know any foreign investment now is 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 de-risked because right. across yes. the region and it's also it's easier to make it more significant because you're now talking about you know 10 million people with 60 million tourists and you know, if you just look yeah. at the english speaking caribbean so it's not an insignificant market and more than anything else it offers it offers um an opportunity to see what it would be like in other developed blocks you know, we can talk about South America till the cows come home, but until we solve how do, how do you actually allocate or how do you see the capitalism and, and the economies of scale sort of balance out, who's going to grow, who's going to extract, who's going to test, who's going to manufacture, and those different variables, um, which we have really good opportunity to see here in the Caribbean. I mean, you know, Trinidad is a, is a much more developed economy than some of the other um, islands, but at the same right. token, their sophisticated manufacturing base and low cost of energy allow them to do things that are just not economic to do in Jamaica per se, right? But Jamaica's, yeah. you know, bigger sort of agricultural and technical workforce, right? Mm -hmm. Also allow it to do things that you, you can't readily do in, in Trinidad, you know? So, I mean, it, that's the beauty of it. You know, Barbados mm -hmm. is not really interested so far as it, from my reading of, of a developing a large, cultivation footprint but Barbados also has a high ticket tourism and wellness market so you know what I mean you have these different elements of the industry as a whole that can come together and really become a very useful model um, that serves the population in the interim both in terms of economic progress and a better a better level of, 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 of health care so I, I'd like to see that happen you know I don't know how I mean I just I shouldn't say I don't know how I went to the yeah. The UN event the other day, uh, the Regenibus Cannabis held, you know, a cannabis conference at the UN. It was quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. And so you are seeing the more staid conservative organizations saying, wait a minute, we need to, we need to not just explore it, but we need to be able to be seen to be exploring it. You know, so it, right. it, that's a very good um, pivot point, I believe, and an entry point for more conservative governments now once they understand that they can stand behind it because the populations for it and it has direct benefit to their populations can really roll it out. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned uh, uh, South America and that was one of the things that I saw here uh, at this event. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, you know, Mila, uh, the hash queen is doing Dabadoo events in Ecuador and Brazil. And I mean, she's hitting every country in South America. They are booming. How is concentrates and what's the concentrate market like in Jamaica now? And do you see that being a growing market or do you think it's always going to stay into the more casual kind of relaxed flower market? Well, I'm seeing, I'm seeing um, Castle Black. They're opening some lounges. I see them, them talking about some cannabis clubs. So I, I do think you're going to have more variation in terms of, you know, what the, what the, re, the retail footprint looks like and therefore what the product offerings are going to be. You know, um, one of the one of the things I've seen with some of the dispensaries here, and I you know I've said to this to a couple of them all the time, I'm like, you keep your marketing to the the the, the already converted. You know, the 10% the of the market that are already like, I'm gonna go into dispensary, mm -hmm. that's all you're talking to. You need to talk right. to the people who are like, boy, you know, what if my friends see me going into dispensary? Or if I go in, is some 21 year old gonna run circles around me with a bunch of technical jargon and I'm gonna feel like an idiot. And so at my 45 years old, I'm not comfortable to go in there. You know, these are part of the communication things that need to take place so that people feel that greater comfort, you know? And I think once you move into that, then there's more of a demand or, or opportunity for different types of products and different types of, of consumption. Um, yeah. Versus now where it's like, okay, I'm going to go in, how do I get the prescription? You know what I mean? All of these different uncertainties that people have, which obviously inhibit consumer behavior, which obviously inhibit the growth of the market, you know, sure. so all of these things we need to, we need to address. You know, I had a conversation with uh, Jonathan Hirsch, uh, who you know well, and uh, he did, uh, we did a, a, a debate, a, a discussion during this year's Jack Herrick Cup in Amsterdam. 
-hmm. And we did a tabletop discussion. And one of the things that he was proposing is the fact that with dabs, you can dose specific mm. doses right and so he was he was suggesting that you know if you're going to bring grandma into the the medical marijuana it might be best to do it with a dab interesting now 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 that because you could have a spe very specific amount right 10 okay. milligram that bam that's it so up my argument was but all the equipment is scary as hell because you got to use the blow torch <laughs> or you got to have all this other stuff I did see Puffco uh, this week uh, launched a whole new line of uh, pipes, and they all look like you know uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes pipes. Oh, really? And they are—they're the new. They're very fashionable, very cool. They've got an Indian one. They've got all kinds of cool ones. I see that as being one of the directions that I think will help, you know, for the concentrate market, especially for older folks, because that blowtorch reminds everybody of, of crack cocaine. I think. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Plus, who wants, to, who wants to give that to grandma and then be responsible for like burning off her eyebrows? <laughs> <laughs> grandma, you what happened to your eyebrows? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, can you tell us that what are the dates again for for this year's and what is the time frame for people to sign up if they want to come and participate? Yeah, it's September fifteenth to the seventeenth. Um, we have travel packages we worked out with our host hotels and offer you like you know collective savings on the different uh, on the trip. So. Those usually run from the 14th to the 18th. Um, okay. You can get more information on our website, of course, canxjamaica.com slash canx2022. And that has, that has the packages and it has all the different tickets, the agenda, et cetera, et cetera. We load up all the speakers. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they can follow you on Instagram and also on Facebook. Is there any Absolutely. others? That... Instagram okay. is can at Canix Jamaica and Facebook is facebook.com slash canxjamaica. Wow. Dude, I have so much respect for you and what you've done here. And uh, again, having seen it firsthand with my with my own eyeballs, I know the commitment uh, that you have put in here. And, you know, again, I go to lots of events all the time. There's a level of care here that is superior. And I have so much respect for you. And thank you um, for what you're doing there. And um, uh, hopefully uh, all of these uh, uh, illnesses and uh, viruses and stuff will go away soon and uh, we'll be back into a free world of uh, of coming to Jamaica every other month which is what I'd like to do yeah that's right <laughs> I appreciate the kind words man we welcome you back you know I feel yeah. very blessed to be able to, to to facilitate this and you know I just I just welcome the day when we can really see the benefits manifest all throughout Jamaica and all throughout the Caribbean so yeah I can't wait thank you kind sir much respect and I right. uh, hope to see you soon Cool. You too, man. See you in September for sure. Yes, I'm coming. I'm coming. Right. I think I'm coming. Right. I'm coming. <laughs> right. cool. Thank you, my friend. Right. Yep. Just sucking up the sun, enjoying the waves. What a great interview that was with Douglas Gordon. Dude, I'm telling you right now, that Canix event last time was one of the best events that I ever went to. Truly allowed me to interact and network with some of the biggest players in the industry. And I can't recommend it any higher. So I hope I'll get a chance to see you guys there in September. In the meantime, enjoy this beautiful beach. And I will see you guys next time. It's Captain Hooter, far out, man.